yes. quote of a, a hadith. Oh, yes, please. This hadith says, O Muhammad, this is supposed to be Allah speaking to Muhammad. Right. O Muhammad, I looked at all my creation, I chose you from among all of them. Mm. Then I derived a name for you from my name. Therefore, it is not permitted that anyone mention me without you with me. <laughs> my name is Mahmoud, and your name is Muhammad. Really? Now, is that Sahih? What, what is now, that? this isn't Sahih Muslim or okay. Bukhari. This okay. is actually from a, a Shia book of uh, Hadith. Oh, okay. All right. Now, and of course, I know some of the Muslims are going to, uh, the Sunnis are going to say, well, that's from the Shia, and they're off, and they're, in there. they're not real Muslims, blah, blah, blah. But the, the principle yes. is, a, is acceptable in Sunni Islam. This is in Islam. Because, because as you just pointed out, yeah. the name Muhammad means praise yeah the praise praise one so it is derived yeah from the names and attributes of Allah there's a problem here I, I smell a problem uh, two four eight four one six thirteen hundred love to hear from you before we do that we want to go to our brother uh, dr. Costa uh, brother uh, Tony was just telling us a little bit about the followers of Muhammad and how great they felt he was uh, maybe you could speak a bit to uh, uh, his relationship with his enemies, uh, claiming that he's the greatest, of course. <clears throat> yeah, so let me, let me just make the, the statement that to claim to be the greatest, of course, is a pretty tall order. You're not just saying you're great, you're not just saying you're greater, which is a comparative, but the greatest, which is a superlative, which incidentally, Allahu Akbar is also a superlative. It doesn't mean Allah is greater, uh, or um, it doesn't mean that Allah is, is the, the, the great, it means that he is greater than yeah. his comparative, greater than your gods and so forth. Um, and so um, I think it's important for us to realize that the greatest human being, of course, would be conceived of as being perfect, as being someone with a high moral character. And I think we would all agree that the greatest human being would also be a sinless human being, that is, mm -hmm. having no imperfections. Yeah. And it's already been noted that uh, Muhammad's name is mentioned four times in the Quran. It's also been mentioned that Jesus' name is mentioned 25 times in the Quran, and even the Muslim sources admit openly that whereas Muhammad was a sinner, Allah told him to confess his sins, and he said in the Hadith, I confess my sins 70 times a day, and I ask that Allah uh, uh, scatter my sins as far as the east is from the west. Jesus in the Quran is the only prophet who is pure, he is faultless. Jesus is the only prophet in the Quran who is virgin born he is the only prophet who's the word of god he is the spirit of god he's the only prophet that performs miracles that muhammad never uh, never performed and he's the only prophet who's alive in heaven according to islam they believe that jesus is still alive in heaven but when we look at the way muhammad treated his enemies there's such a stark contrast muhammad taught his followers that they are to hate their enemies jesus taught that we ought to love our enemies Muhammad taught that the enemies of Allah are to be destroyed, and uh, Jews and Christians in particular, the people of the book, they are told in, in Surah 9, verse 29, that you are to fight the people of the book, those who uh, deny uh, Allah, who do not forbid what Allah and his messenger forbid. And uh, if Jews and Christians, the people of the book, do not submit to Islam, then they are to be given uh, the jizya. So Muhammad would torture his enemies, uh, Muhammad would lie to his enemies, Muhammad would order the killing of his enemies if they mocked him in poetry uh, or in talk. So his his reaction to his enemies was was one of outright violence and torture. Compared to Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus showed nothing but love and compassion and even died for his enemies, something mm. Muhammad never did. Mm. Mm. You know, I've heard it said, Brother C.L., that... Um and again, this is just one of these things that they say. I can't even remember who said it, but it was an interesting thing at the time. Um, a man is not, his character is not judged as by how he treats his friends, but how he treats his enemies. Mm. Uh, and, and I think that's a really, uh, you know, a thought that we, when we apply it to Jesus as Tony just did and Muhammad, we see a stark contrast. And Tony, I want to just ask you, because you brought something out. Uh, Dr. David Cashin did it as well as Jonathan McClatchy in our earlier program. Uh, and, and we understand that there are Christians, Arab Christians and others, including missionaries, um, who will often use the Quran to try to explain to Muslims that in the Quran, Jesus in many ways holds a higher place or a greater place than Muhammad. And, and I think that when we study the Quran, we do find that. 
And Tony, I just would like, I, I know this is a bit off script, but I wonder if you or CL have any um, idea about that because uh, the, the traditional view is these, these are Allah's words being passed from Gabriel, Jibreel, through Muhammad's mouth. So um, w w what would seem to come about from this would be that Allah, e either Allah thinks that Jesus is greater than Muhammad and that's why it says that in the Quran, or, uh, or somehow or another, uh, the Quran has been corrupted, and uh, it's not exactly what Muhammad originally said. Uh, or, um, you know, it, it just happens to be the truth. Muhammad isn't the greatest. How, how do we get that? We would think with Islamic theology that the Quran would really pump up Muhammad more than Jesus, but when we really study it, that's not the case. Brother Tony, do you right. have any ideas on that? You're absolutely right. Uh, compare that to the Gospels, where Jesus is mentioned all over the Gospels. He is the central figure in the Gospel accounts and throughout the New Testament. Uh, in the case of the Quran, only four times Muhammad's name is mentioned in the Arabic, and yet Jesus is 25 times. And so it almost seems to be that what we have in the Quran is actually a, a following after Jesus as the superior prophet. Some scholars have even speculated that Muhammad was originally a title for Jesus, that the praised one was actually Jesus, the servant of Allah. So this has been proposed by a number of scholars, um, but they would also argue that Muhammad uh, did not exist and that Muhammad was later fabricated and, and filled in. Right. But there is no doubt about the fact that no one could read the Quran and walk away without realizing that Jesus is, is head and shoulders above the rest. Mm. He is so unlike Muhammad. Um, again, his virgin birth, uh, his supernatural uh, miracles that he performed, the fact that he is the the the, uh, the kalimat, the the word of Allah, the the rule Allah, mm. the spirit from Allah, mm. and so forth, uh, that he is a sign. Um, all of these things speak of the greatness of Jesus, and the fact that even Islam teaches that Jesus is the only prophet who is bodily in heaven right now. He is bodily in heaven. Mm. So it almost seems like, as some scholars have suggested, that we may have here a very ancient uh, Aryan cult that saw Jesus as only a, a servant of Allah, just a, a mighty servant of Allah, and that this was really a Christian heresy that later developed into Islam. But that, again, uh, is something that scholars continue to debate. Thank you, Tony. Boy, uh, there's a whole series of shows right there on this topic. <laughs> you know, real quickly, before I go back to CL, uh, he mentioned all of this evidence in the Quran, and, and, and one of my favorite hadith uh, is the one that says, you know, hey, uh, every, uh, every child that's in the womb of the mother, Satan touches, mm -hmm. except one. And, you know, when you first read that, you think, oh, well, this is going to be Muhammad. No, it's Jesus. Uh, Jesus, who uh, Satan tried to touch, and he touched the placenta instead, so he didn't quite get it right. But anyways, to me, what, what a... What a telling hadith from, from Sahih al-Bukhari, mm -hmm. which almost in our understanding, and you, I know we're putting our grid over it of understanding, but it almost sounds like, hey, Jesus is the only one who doesn't have original sin. And that, of course, is what we believe. Well, uh, Dr. Tony Costa just mentioned that yeah. Muhammad repeatedly yeah. in hadith literature has to ask for forgiveness of his sins. Seventy times in a day, I guess towards the end of his life, he really got concerned or something. Just... From Muslim, the messenger of Allah said, sometimes I perceive a veil over my heart mm. and I supplicate Allah for forgiveness a hundred times a day. But here's one that's very telling that goes to the, uh, to the, the condition of the heart. Yeah. And what we would call the doctrine of the original sin, yes. which Muslims obviously do not believe in. Right. But Muhammad, their messenger, he says, by the one in whose hand my soul is, if you do not commit sins, Allah will replace you with the people who would commit sins and seek forgiveness from Allah, and Allah is certainly certain of forgiveness of them. So it's better to commit sin and ask for forgiveness than to be sinless, according to Muhammad. Yes. <laughs> so according to, 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 I'm just using a little bit of logic. Yeah. Right? Uh, Muhammad tells his followers, if you don't commit sins, yeah. Allah will replace you with people who would commit sin, so mm. they would ask for forgiveness. Mm. So since Muhammad himself asked for forgiveness, yeah. doesn't this mean that uh, Muhammad sinned, or else he would have been replaced? 
Well, it almost be, it, it, it doesn't, it almost sounds like uh, Muhammad's following up Jesus. Jesus, of course, was sinless. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to bring a sinner in that'll actually ask me for forgiveness. So now we've got <laughs> Muhammad. I know that's a big of a stretch, but that's what I thought of when you said that. The CL, um, here's something. As a former Muslim, mm -hmm. all of these things that, that you're sharing right now, uh, how much of that when you became a Muslim or started studying, how much of this were you privy to? Or if you were privy to it, did you just kind of ignore it or, or what? When I became a Muslim, um, I was, I came into Islam being very unsure about the Trinity. Sure. And about the uh, doctrines like the incarnation and mm -hmm. hypostatic mixture, of, uh, the crisis nature, human, and I didn't know how all that fit together and how yeah. it worked and I didn't really know the proofs for it. Okay. And I always just had doubts about it. Right. So it was pretty easy when people began to give me dawah to come to me and say, listen, that all sounds very complicated. Yes. In Islam, you just believe in one God. Yeah. Allah, who Akbar, put up, the, put up the little finger. Right. That's all you have to believe. You don't have to deal with all this Trinity stuff and incarnations yeah. and God. <laughs> has, you don't have to deal with all that. Yes. Just believe in one God. Yes. So it was, and plus I had a, uh, as a child, I was exposed to Jehovah Witnesses. Oh, Okay. So I was exposed to the Jehovah Witnesses, so I had a little bit of that in my background as Your well. Your predisposition was already there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I see. So it was easy for me to, okay, to accept that and go into that. Mm. This seems a whole lot simpler. It seems a lot, if it's simpler, the, the, the argument was simple equals purity. Mm -hmm. Even though if you get into some arguments or, well, some discussions with Muslim scholars and students and knowledge, you will find out that... It's not as simple as the, uh, you know, the uh, average Muslim who goes to the mosque and, and fasts on Ramadan thinks right. it is. Right. It's not that simple. Look at the hadith. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I mean, my goodness. Well, let me ask you then, what did Muhammad do uh, from a Muslim position or point of view? What did Muhammad do to be considered the greatest man of all time according to Islam? I mean, we understand that Muslims think he's the greatest, but I mean, what, what would they claim? What would they say? You know, if you say, okay, you're, you're a Muslim, and say, well, oh, you know, Muhammad, Muhammad. What, what makes you think Muhammad is so wonderful to the point that he's the greatest man? And we know Surah 33, uh, 21, you have indeed in the Messenger of Allah a beautiful pattern mm -hmm. of conduct for anyone whose hope is in Allah in the final day and who engages much in the praise of Allah. So in this verse and others like it, you have the whole uh, doctrine of, of really the Sunnah, right? I mean, yes. the idea that you follow Muhammad's example because he's the perfect man. Mm -hmm. And of course, he was Arab, and I'm half Arab, so I'm half perfect. But anyway, <laughs> CL, go ahead. <laughs> well, in summary, you can say that um, they would say that Mo the Muhammad was a prophet in a line of prophets who came before him. So all your Old Testament, pr Testament prophets, including John the Baptist, including Jesus himself, Muhammad, he just fits right into that line of prophets. Mm -hmm. He's the final prophet. Mm -hmm. um, they the would seal even, of the prophets. The seal of the yeah. prophets. Yeah. Uh, they would even point to certain passages in the Bible, like Deuteronomy 18:18, 18, 18, about the, Moses making the prediction of a prophet like himself. They would say, that's Muhammad. Yeah. Uh, they would say, Isaiah 29 and 12, um, I gave the, the book to one who was not learned. And mm. the person said, I, I was not learned. Uh, he, they would say, that's Muhammad. Yeah, that's the, the yeah. angel, the Gabriel, went Muhammad in the cave of Hira. They would say, Song of Solomon uh, 516, yeah. um, my beloved one. And the is, word in is, the Hebrew is, is that word? Machmadam, I believe. Yeah. That's, that's really Muhammad. Yeah. That's Muhammad. They would even point to John 14, 16, and other yeah. parts of John 14. Uh, saying that uh, Jesus was telling his disciples that he was leaving so he could send Muhammad. Not the Holy the Spirit, Father. but Muhammad. Muhammad. Uh, they will point to Muhammad's um, voyage upon the winged creature mm. to the Temple Mount yeah. and his voyage up into the third heaven to meet what uh, some say that he saw Allah, some mm. debate that he didn't see Allah, but he spoke to Allah and yeah. he spoke to him face to face and he was given his charge and his mission, and yeah. he was, he was revving to go after that point. And he ascended above all the other prophets to uh, exactly, do so. Exactly, yeah. exactly. The imagery is very yes. uh, rich in Islamic uh, view. Yeah. Um, they, 
of course, that he's a prophet and he has received the Quran and the Sunnah, yeah. which are two revelations. These are the final revelations. These are the revelations that make everything clear. Mm. So everything previous to this is judged in light of the Quran and the Sunnah. So you will take the, uh, the Old Testament, you mm. take the New Testament, you take the Gospels, and you read them in light of what's attributed to Muhammad. And of course, we've already said that he's the last and final prophet, but he's also called the beloved one of God. He's called the light of the world. He's, the, he's given a, the title and the position of being intercessor on behalf of Muslims and the world on the day of judgment. Mm. So, all, well, thank you. So basically, his position in the theology of Islam, um, the claim that, that all of the Old Testament and New Testament is essentially there to point towards Muhammad, mm -hmm. and uh, the idea that he's the, the mediator of, well, we wouldn't call the New Covenant, but the final revelation of Allah. So, but it's not so much, you know, what he actually did as a man, it's more his position through Islamic theology. So once again, we find ourselves kind of arguing in a circle, don't we? Yeah, well, the, his position in Islamic theology is used to interpret mm. what he did in everyday life. Gotcha. So if he killed, if someone writes a poem against him right. and that enrages him and he said, who will get rid of this person for me and his followers go kill the person in the middle of the night, yeah. well, you can just say, well, he's the last and final prophet. He has every right. Whatever he does is automatically right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> well uh, yeah. Well, we can see that. And, and it's, it's the same thing as Allah in Islam, hmm. the capricious Allah. Uh, whatever he does is right. Even if he contradicts himself, it doesn't matter. This is a, a problem from our view, but in the Islam, Wasn't not the show really. Wasn't we, we were on together when um, uh, Akil was on? Yes. And describing Islamic heaven? Uh, well, well, okay, we, the last one we did was, do Muslims break the first commandment? No, I don't think that was okay. that show. Okay, okay. Uh, I think it was another show with me and Tony Cus. But yeah. um, uh, a Muslim, a da Daoist, um, was on the show, and he described how this life is a prison for believers. Ah, but uh, Jinnah, yeah. uh, the prison is let loose. Ah. It's time to do all the stuff that you wanted to do on earth. I see. You get to do it in, in uh, Allah's heaven. Isn't that amazing? So, so the carnal lusts that mm -hmm. we're told in the Bible are wrong are actually um, sanctified in Allah's presence in, in Jannah. Holy whores. Amazing. Amazing. We only have a few minutes left before the break, and I want to go back to uh, Dr. Costa. Uh, dear brother, uh, you know, today uh, people are judged uh, in such a political correct uh, manner, and uh, I don't know that you have time about four minutes before the break, but if you wanted to touch on this subject, and we could come back to it afterwards, this idea, you know, <laughs> well, well, real quickly, we, we understand that what Orthodox Islam says is the reason for Muhammad being so great. If you go to some seminar at a mosque here in America, it might be say, well, he elevated women. Uh, you know, he, he elevated the African uh, race. Uh, you know, he, he did this and he did that. But uh, one of the things today is, you know, human rights. Uh, uh, so, so basically, the Dawah, they're saying, uh, and it's really Takiyah, but they're saying, oh, Muhammad, you know, he, he helped humanity, human rights. I mean, what do you think, uh, Dr. Costa? Well, absolutely not. Uh, Sharia law, which is the law of Islam, violates the, uh, the, the Bill of Rights. It violates the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, there is no freedom of speech in Islam. There is no freedom to criticize in Islam. There is no freedom to convert from Islam to another religion. There is no equality of women in Islam. Muhammad considered women to be deficient in knowledge and in religion, and he believed that the majority of the inhabitants of hell uh, were women because they were disobedient to their husbands. And so um, there is absolutely no human rights within Islam. Uh, there is no democratic rights. There is no country under God's, uh, under God's uh, son where we have Sharia law and you have the enjoyment of democratic freedoms, where women are on equal levels with men. Uh, and so this is one of the greatest political correct, or actually politically incorrect views, mm. that women are equal to men. And uh, there's no doubt about it. The Quran is very clear. The testimony of woman is, is half that of a man. Muhammad approved of spousal abuse in Surah 4, verse 24. You could scourge or beat your wives who are suspected to be unfaithful and so forth. 
And uh, even women, if they walk in front of a praying uh, Muslim man, they have disqualified the prayer, and uh, they've been put on the same level as dogs and donkeys, according to Hadith. Mm. So, no, nothing could be uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Well, I, I'd like you, we're going to take a break, but when we come back, I'd like you to tell us a little bit uh, about the, uh, is it MU-103? Is that the M-103. 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 I'd like you to talk a little bit about that Certainly. after the break and, and how that relates, if it does, to uh, human rights and Islam, uh, our brother being in Canada and that being much in the news and we mm. uh, south of the border there need to understand what's taking place. And, you know, we have a, a current uh, administration in the White House that that, that kind of thing is, is unlikely to come through. Uh, the previous administration a lot more likely, but who's to know the political winds can easily change again and we might be in the very same boat and it's such a, so important to know about. And, and basically, I believe what we're going to hear from my brother is, is that this does relate to the topic, you know, because what, what it seems is the, is the, demif the demification of the West. Uh, and we could talk more about that and other things uh, after the break in just a moment. I want to remind you we are here in our Apologetics Marathon. we got a wonderful program this evening. Was Muhammad the greatest man of all time? Uh, maybe there's a Muslim out there. Muslim, you call in and tell us uh, why you believe he is. Certainly, we believe that the greatest man of all time was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the God-man who was sinless and perfect and died for your sins and all who would truly believe. So uh, please stay with us, call others, encourage them to watch, and we'll be right back after this short break. 